they could travel the speed of light, but the graphics suck. If I'm reading this right, this might be by Wyckoff. Wyckoff. Gotta watch how I say that. Hello, right, one day is Thursday, November 21st, 2024. This is the week. Ed Charts. I'm just going to thank all you guys and girls for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here. I appreciate that very much. So what are we talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, I'll have a lot to say about that. As usual, very mixed out there, but one day to the next, right? Uh, one day at a time. And today, a lot of areas improved. A lot of areas still look really bad, but a lot of areas did improve. Anyway, your questions on trading, feel free to just type them in. If you're on YouTube, give me a second or two to catch up to you. Uh, your stock and crypto picks, uh, put them in one at a time and then put carriage return. And that way, carriage return, show my age. Uh, enter. <laughs> that way I know. So we're going to focus on a lot of uh, the methodology in action tonight. We've got a new mystery chart. We have some updates to some old ones. Uh, TFM 10% update i have an altcoin trade i want to show you ledger 100 and that smoking report i guess technically uh was from the last show but we did have two of them that hit the profit target but unfortunately stopped out spoiler alert and then i'm going to touch upon a million little things i got one or two things i want to talk about there uh that's the series i've been doing a million little things will make you a successful trader and that'll make sense in just one minute q a and there's my contact information i'll show you that in just one second again as a claim screen as you know you can lose money trading or as all the summing up all predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then once again there's my contact information feel free to shoot a screenshot of it and if you watch the recording you could just obviously just hit pause uh, my email is david dave lander.com i guess they put that in there too all right let's talk about the mystery charts and the methodology in action so we have a new mystery chart this week and you can see this stock really took off and it had a really nice deep retracement it was also a landry like pullback i'll show you that in just one second and that's from today's service i guess i don't guess that does much for you <laughs> but you can see the date this is the date i first recommended it this date tends to confuse a lot of people this is the first day so if you find the 15th on here which would probably be like right there that's when I first recommended it. Anyway, entries here, stop is down here, and the IPT is up here. Let's take a look at that with the Landry Light. Landry Light, for upside Landry Light, is simply lows or greater than the moving average. So you can see lows, obviously, greater than moving average. The moving average in this case is the 30 exponential. That's quickly become my favorite moving average, and I'll show you that in crypto too. It works really well in crypto also. But anyway, look down below. You can see the Landry like count. Remember, it does not measure magnitude, just simply the number of bars these lows are greater than moving average. So you see right here, really easy to see right here. One, two, three, four, and then on the fifth bar it hit. Okay, so one, two, three, four. Notice the Landry like count is going up, even though the chart is going down, the price is going down. So always look at the actual chart. And obviously, it's going to go down when you have a pullback like this. And notice here, it went back to zero. If you were scanning for it, you'd put in some parameters like 10 or 20 bars of upside Landry light, and then you'd look for zero when it pulled back to that moving average. Anyway, so that's the setup there. And again, this doesn't me measure magnitude. It simply measures the number of bars. But it can help to give you a really good visual presentation i was just doing a presentation for meta stock and i showed some longer term landry light in the charts and i was pretty impressed that uh, just that you could see the big green bars and the big red bars especially when you when you back it way 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 out it really helps you to see the forest from the trees so it's a it's a silly little indicator but i love it i really do and i find myself using it more and more and of course, I always eyeball the charts as I preach. But anyway, you can see the intersection moving average there. And the Landry light goes back to zero. So we'll follow up on that one in upcoming webinars, good, bad, and indifferent. All right, here's a stock that already triggered an entry. Nice Landry light there. Again, another Landry light pullback, and then you can see it pull back in the chart, and then it eventually pulls all the way back 
to the moving average. So that's the parameters that I chose, and that's for a hypothetical 100K account. Although I do take the actual trades. I didn't I didn't do a screen capture today, but I did get in the stock today. Um, I got in pre market uh, yesterday. It was a it was kind of a fast entry, and it came right back in. And then today I got a little anxious, I guess, pre-market because it was really moving pre-market and I felt like I needed to be in it, especially with uh, Bitcoin doing what, what it's doing. And the other thing too is I am under a little bit of pressure because I recommend these things and I want to follow them as mechanical as possible, but I do use a little discretion. I'll show you how the discretion really didn't pay off this week, but it might on upcoming weeks and sometimes it will. Anyway, the entry was there. Again, it triggered yesterday by about six cents on a fast move and it came back in, unfortunately. But it's since recovered from those lows. Now, if you were taking this as a brand new trade, you could use these parameters, but I would also maybe just use the distance for the parameters. But what I would do is I would enter above this high. That's also known as a trend pivot pullback when you have a little pivot point. Sometimes you have a little pivot point, like a false rally out of a pullback, and then it comes right back in. And if it doesn't take out that pivot point, which obviously I hope it does, I know you should never use the word hope, but I hope it does, then that would be the re-trigger. But that's a that's a good little pattern, that little trend pivot pullback. You have two lower highs surrounded by, or you have a high surrounded by two lower highs is what I'm trying to say on that. But that's a great little pattern. I guess all my patterns are great little patterns. <laughs> you got to believe in your stuff, right? <laughs> Well, I've spent years and years and years and years looking at him. Like uh, one of you guys said, I think it was Mike Peterson, when he was checking me out, he found some forums that were 20 something years old where I was talking about bow ties, just like I do today. And he was like, okay, well, this guy is talking to talk, walking to walk. He's doing the same thing. He's not like some other guy who I'm not going to mention, but I saw he has a new system out just yesterday. And if you buy his newest system, you're going to absolutely print money. But the system we were selling last month, that, that one no longer works. But the new one's going to work, okay? Being a little facetious, obviously. All right, we got a little follow-up on a mystery chart. This one ended badly, spoiler alert. But again, there's that pattern again, the Landry Light pullback. And that was my Metastock last week at Bandcamp presentation that I did, I think it was on last Wednesday, or last Thursday, correction. Anyway, uh, that was kind of my presentation, also kind of a revelation. A while back, we had a string of nice winners, and I went back in and looked at those, and I also looked at some longer-term big winners, and I was shocked that they were all Landry Light pullbacks. They might have been trend pivot pullbacks like that prior chart, but they were also Landry Light pullback. They might have been accelerating momentum strategy, but again, they were also Landry Light pullbacks. So pretty cool little pattern, if I say so myself. I received a panicky email from somebody that was a little overwhelmed, and I actually sent them to that webinar I did just on the Landry Light pullbacks. And if you look at my on my YouTube channel and look at the playlist, in fact, maybe uh, trading quick clips would be the place to go. And uh, I'll make sure I get a link to that down below and post. But if you just go to my YouTube channel, YouTube slash Dave Landry, you'll see playlists and go to quick clips and there's a lot of stuff there in the Landry Light pullback. And what I told this this uh, lady was, it's like, you're trying to figure out everything and that's exactly how I started the, the webinar. Everybody thinks they need to know everything about trading and it can be really overwhelming and that's where you could end up on a holy grail hunt or you know chasing rabbits or whatever you want to say. Go down a rabbit hole of all the different technical indicators. If you're not careful, you could end up doing something really arcane ended up in a lot of trouble but the bottom line is you don't have to know everything you just need to know one thing okay and one pattern like linda rasky said all you need is one pattern to be successful i think this could be just as good as anything else uh, linda rasky actually has a moving average pattern similar to this except she uses adx i used adx by the way years ago i know i'm going great circle route but <laughs> i'm doing the weave <laughs> but uh I used ADX years ago, and it's kind of a long story. Uh, but my problem with it was we were we were held to. Uh, I don't want to give away too much on this because it's um, it's old stuff. <laughs> but uh, we were we were supposed to pick stocks based on they had to have an ADX of, of a certain height, uh, certain number or higher. 
and it just didn't work. And I know this this system worked in prior years. Uh, and so I would kind of modified it. Just I would just eyeball the charts, and I would um, every now and then I get caught not using the ADX. But anyway, two drink minimum, all those stories. But um, anyway, I think Rasky's pattern uses the ADX. I prefer to just eyeball a chart and use Landry Light because that ADX could take a long time to catch up. And then ADX, it's a very complex formula. It, it goes up and down. Uh, and so even, even in an uptrend, you could have some bars that are taken away from the ADX, whereas Landry Light just gives you that count so you can see how long it's been in a trend. Anyway, nice little pullback there. ZK, if you ever want to look at any of these trades, I would say I, I try not to show anything that I haven't recommended before. That's why I put one of my crypto trades into Facebook earlier today so I could talk about it. Not that I'm trading without you guys. It's just uh, sometimes I get busy. Like yesterday, I was showing a, a friend or a day before, I was showing a friend who was interested in markets. I was putting on some crypto trades so he could see them. And uh, but I will try to put them in the group. But these come all these stock trades that are core methodology like this. Whatever I showed this little spreadsheet on the bottom snippet, or whatever you want to call that screenshot, that's coming straight from my trading service. And those archives are davelandcom slash archives. Anyway, getting back to this chart, entry was here, stop was down here, initial profit target was here. So let's take a look at what happened. The IPT was hit fairly quickly on day three, I believe, if memory serves, maybe day four. And at that point, we banked $1,000. We're up $2,000 per 100K. And then the stop goes to break even. So the worst that can happen, boring overnight gaps, would be a scratch on the remainder of the trade. At least you make something right. And unfortunately, this became one where at least we made something. It stopped out. I find it's much harder to like when a market just has this huge one day pop and you get your profit target, you feel really good and you just, you're all happy. Those are hard to sustain, but if it just kind of gradually bumps along, bumps along, takes a little while to hit the profit target, it's much more boring, but it's far more sustainable and the real money is going to be in that second low. But anyway, so this is how I, this is the spreadsheet. This is the mechanical spreadsheet. And I do put a little discretion on this. In this case, my discretion uh, ended up a little bit worse, but you can see it's 400 shares total. And then we tr we put all those shares on at once, by the way, I, I know I repeat a lot of things, but there's always new people coming in. And we take off half of those shares, in this case it'd be 200 at the IPT. And then we hold on as long as we can and we let that stop loosen up over time. Unfortunately, this one stopped back out, but this is better than the poking eye trade. And by the way, I need to dig the email out. It would probably be a good week of charge presentation in and of itself. But uh, this gentleman was asking me, was pointing out all the trades over the last uh, many months, let's see, since I guess six months. And he was pointing out that most of them hit the IPT and came back in. And this question always comes up. Well, Dave, why not take 100% of the profits? In this case, You'd have gotten two thousand dollars, and what I'm getting ready to show you, you got two thousand dollars versus one thousand dollars round numbers on 100k. Well, the reason is that second loaf is where the real money is. When you make 500 percent on the second loaf, or two or three hundred percent at least, or whatever the case may be, that's when it begins to pay off. Anyway, so you can see I didn't do so hot. I gave up a little bit on the second loaf, trying to apply a little discretion. And then I ended up uh, with a little bit different entry, a little bit different exit. So I didn't quite get my thousand, but I was the goal was to obviously make a lot of money on a second loaf, and that didn't materialize. So better than poking the eye. Okay, Nick says when looking to this is on YouTube. When looking to make a buy and you get an early morning gap, how do you handle those situations? Okay, uh, real quick, a couple things. If the gap is below your price, then your entry is still valid, obviously. And what you do then is you watch for a fast move on the open, sort of like what Wolf did. Sometimes you'll get these really fast moves on the open and you'll get a trigger it will come right back in. So that's when you'll have to use a little discretion, say, okay, it's gapped and oh, it's making a fast move. It went through my entry. So now I need to make that no or no or a go or no go decision. And it's kind of a no brainer again, if it's below your entry, 
And unless it spikes right through your entry, it comes right back in and you're willing to apply a little bit of discretion, then you don't take that trade, okay? But as a general statement, as long as the open is below your entry price, then your entry is still valid and you take that entry. Now, again, as I said a second ago, if you get a fast move on the open, gap or no gap, that's when you need to make a decision to see if it comes back in and then possibly do a re-entry. Now, technically, I should have re-entered above the high on the wolf, but since it's already triggered in my service and I felt like I needed to get long before it got away from me, I went in, I got a little uh, excited when I saw Bitcoin, whatever it was, that was 93, then 94, or whatever it was, uh, 1,000 or this morning. Now, if it, if it gaps well above your entry, that's when you really need to watch for an open gap reversal. And sometimes you just have to let them go, okay? So hopefully that helps. Could you use like a 30 minute breakout? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You could, um, especially if it, if, it, if it gaps up and then comes back in or whatever, then you can look to play a breakout. And if the gap is somewhat sizable, even you could, you could even play a breakout. It depends on how far you want to go with it, okay? If you're kind of a more of a trader type, then you can apply the discretion that I just said. And then you, what you might do, and I've done this before too, and I'm trying to think of this a setup. It might have been on the clove. But on one of these stocks, it triggered and came back in, and then it was flatlined all day long. But at the end of the day, it had a breakout, intraday breakout, and that's when I got in on that one. So if they kind of gap higher and then kind of go sideways, yeah, absolutely. It depends on how advanced you are as a trade. I, Nick, I know you've been around a little bit, so I know I know you know what you're doing. So in that case, absolutely. All right, here's the CLOV. This is the former mystery chart. And again, this is kind of a accelerating momentum. Notice that the, the price began to accelerate higher. Always look at price, even though the Landry light is kind of cool. Make sure you're looking at price, too, to see what it's doing. But you can see it pulled back to the moving average. Notice you did have one or two more bars of Landry light before it came back in again. Entry was here, stop was here, IPT was here. So at the IPT, you have 2,000 per 100K. You bank half of that, and then you bring that stop to break even. And then as the market moves in your favor, you trail your stop loosely. And you can see, again, we got stopped out on the second low and made a little bit on that. So you can see 1150 overall. The ultimate goal would be a 400% or 500% move on the second loaf, okay? That's where you want to be. And obviously, it didn't happen. So here's my trades here. Not quite as good as the mechanical service. I made 920 in the first loaf and 60 on the second. By the way, this is my, what I call my model account, where I model out the trades as close to the service as possible. That's why I was a little bit more anxious to get in on that wolf because i didn't want to i didn't want to miss the move should it materialize and not be in and have trades to show you anyway so here's one that i announced earlier on facebook and this is a bit of a bummer and this is a problem i've been seeing lately i've had quite a few of these do this and i guess i need to set some alarms or something to alert me to this fact but once again very simple setup not quite a landry light pullback i'm sure if you put it in a 20 ema it probably would be that was the original pattern if you look in i think it was in the layman's guide to trading stocks anyway you can see nice little pullback in this one i kind of front ran it a little bit instead of getting it in above this bar or higher i got in sort of midstream and unfortunately, it came fairly close to that IPT. I'm still in this one, but it didn't quite hit it. I have a limit order in for 20%. Now, in stocks, if you go in and look at that percent risk column, you can see that's my stop distance, which is also my initial profit target distance, okay? It might seem a little arbitrary if you're new to the trading service, but basically what i'm doing is there is some science behind it and there's a little bit of feel too i'm looking at where would i be wrong in the setup you take a look at that clove which was four dollars a share and it's a very volatile stock so it was like a very wide stop like 30 percent or 25 percent or something like that whatever that was in a little spreadsheet i just showed and something that's a little bit less volatile it might only be 10 percent or 15 percent now keep in mind as I've said a thousand times, there's a popular method out there that says you shouldn't lose more than 8% in a stock. That's price value, okay? 
before getting out. Well, a lot of the stocks that I like to trade trade eight percent in ten minutes. So that would you would almost guarantee yourself a, a constant uh, string of losing trades. By the way, uh, tight stops are universally preached, but in reality, you'd actually probably do better if you loosened your stop up a little bit, stops up a little bit, you catch more trends. So this is something I haven't solved for, these near misses in crypto. And, you know, I'm just thinking out loud, maybe I need to put the limit order in, and then maybe I need to put in an alert that's somewhere close to the price. But then I kind of like to be a little hands-off with this. I've got enough going on without sitting there and watching a crypto screen, screen all day. But anyway, all right, Keith says, I had Oklo took partials at 25 but then out, stopped out at a gap, now it's recovering. Did you hold on to it? I have some Oklo left, but I'm not I'm not saying that I did something that was prudent. Okay. Remember I did that, I wouldn't call it a front run, but I played that gap. We could pull the chart later. And that's why I didn't want to put that as one of my examples because I'm not sure that I use best practices on that. But I only have a hundred shares. I did 200 shares, I flipped out. 100 for a point gain or whatever it was that I kept 100 and I do have some I did I have a small account that's been dormant for a long long time and I put 200 shares in that account a while back and I'm trying to hang on because it looked like it was uh it looked like it had longer term potential but that my trading on Oak Club is not necessarily what I'd recommend you do that's just kind of an, an outlier Anyway, the uh, as I said a few days ago, was this his first visit? I'm trying to think. This uh, friend of mine from the gym wanted to come by. He wanted to learn how to trade crypto. Unfortunately, he wanted a secret formula, and he doesn't. I don't think he wants to work. But uh, so he's probably not watching, so I could pick on him. <laughs> you know, I used to tell everybody, "Oh, just don't worry, it'll be fine." But then I realized that I'm just doing a disservice to everyone, and by not giving them tough love and, and so they they don't spend 10 years of their life or, or longer spinning their wheels as i've seen a lot of people do but anyway with this crypto when the crypto is really running these these shyt coins the shit coins sometimes you just buy them and they're going straight up and we're, we're going to take a look at the live ones in a minute and maybe see if we could find something we could trade and then again i'm using i don't think i closed the loop on this earlier but i'm using a 20 percent initial profit target and I probably should be doing some analysis to figure out the volatility of the pairs like I'm doing in stocks. But right now, it just seems when these things are blowing and going, they could easily go another 20%. And that just seems like a good round number. Hey, Sharon, how you doing? Good to see you. It's been a while. Like I've been saying, uh, I've been mining off some Bitcoin. When I make profits in these altcoins, I take a tiny bit amount and I put it in Bitcoin. And that's actually begun to add up a little bit there's a few thousand dollars now and bitcoins from this little experiment so that's that's been a lot of fun now i am hodling that which i don't recommend but if you're doing it at a very small size i think you're okay like i'm doing here because i'm taking a very small amount of money i'm pretending that i have the high commissions that i had i would kill for 25 dollars commission <laughs> 20 years ago when the commissions were ridiculous. But anyway, so I'm taking just a little bit off and putting in Bitcoin, but each little crumb is beginning to add up. Now, I think this one went 100%, and I meant to look at it earlier, and that's another thing that I might do too, and I have done in the past, is I'll put in a limit order at 100% to take a little bit off. And in these Bitcoins, these Bitcoins, I sound like the old people, these uh, altcoins, a lot of times they'll they'll spike up and they come right back in. And that's why it's good to have that limit order in place when you're trading these. And again, we'll take a look. We'll get the crypto corner in a few minutes. We'll take a look at the live crypto. And so there's the IPT. I mined off a little bit right around the time that IPT was hit. All right, I'm going to go through this really quickly because it's kind of beating a dead horse on this system. But the zones are, and Jeff's here tonight. Jeff uh, was my motivation to put the zone lines in here. Jeff likes to get out of the market when the overall market that is, is down 5% or more. I find that 10% or more is a good round number. And my whipsaw filter is the 50 day, 50 week, I'm sorry, simple moving average there. That's a sell signals. And I have plenty of YouTubes on this. If you want to go check them out. 
but it closed below the moving average and it closed 10% or more away from the 50 week closing high is a sell signal. And a buy signal is two bars of Landry light. This is weekly Landry light on a 50 simple. And the reason I use a simple, by the way, is I wanted lag built into this system. And it's just the opposite of what people will tell you. It's like, oh, you want to eliminate the lag. Well, you can't eliminate the lag. And in fact, you want to build in a little lag to a system to keep you from chasing your tail. This is a longer term system. And I'm kind of putting on a different hat here. This is a mechanical system, but I do use it to help me judge the markets. For instance, uh, just to keep just to keep it simple, and and so I'm, I don't go crazy with my leftover daughter's college funds. I'll when this thing gives me a sell signal, I'll get out of the market. When I get a buy signal, I'll put them back in. Okay. And for SGs, I did a Q trade. I'll show you in just one second. Anyway, so it's had a pretty good run since that last buy. Again, two bars of Landry Light closed within 10% of the 50-week closing high, and it also has to be above the moving average, which it will when that happens. Now, the sell is way down here below the moving average. Now, eventually, this moving average might get above the 10% line. And if it does, then the 10% line becomes your sell. Right now, the sell looks like it's 5,333. Might be a little bit higher with today's price. And by the way, we're using a calendar chart, okay? So... You you would sell on a Friday, and, and I guess that could we could end up with some issues with that if the market crashed somewhere before Friday. But right now that seems to have worked out okay for the last hundred years at least. And my thinking, just real quick, and not to back into the whole thing, but this is a diaper change avoidance type of system. Ian McActivy would call it the diaper change moment when the whole world goes unglued, comes unglued, and markets implode. Well, my thinking is, uh, along the lines of technical analysis 101, is if a market is going to lose half of its value, it's going to lose 10% first. So 10% is a good round number to get out. Let me just check on YouTube here real quick. So here's a cues. Go long 100 shares here, and the stop is here. And again, if you squint your eyes, one, two bars of Landry Light, and you buy, you buy market on close. And then the stop would be way down here at 455. But that's been an incredible run. Now, I've given up, um, I forget how much in the last two weeks. This was 60% plus. But still, it's a pretty good little run 185 points, almost 186 points to when I grab this mark to market. And that comes out to an $18,595 gain. And this back here was a it was just 100 shares, $31,000 investment, investment so to speak. So that's been a pretty good run. I was thinking in, a few days ago, I don't know if I'm going to follow this mechanically forever. And it's like after such a good run, you're going to feel kind of cocky, like, oh, I'll follow it. And it's probably due for quite a bit of whipsaw. By the way, if you're following something like this longer term trend following, you will get a lot of whipsaw in your accuracy will be fairly low although i have to say um knock on wood but you could i can get you the spreadsheet if you want and i just hand tested this by the way the uh spreadsheet looks pretty good and the accuracy is decent and it does keep you out of the market about 30 percent of the time and those are the, that's the best time to be out of the market when you have a sell signal for the most part and uh if you have time read or if you don't have time read it anyway <laughs> Read Greg Morris's book, and he does a lot of talking. He kind of turns a lot of that stuff on its head. Like uh, they'll tell you, well, if you miss the if you miss the ten biggest days, you're not going to make a lot of money. And look at this chart. Well, what if you miss the ten worst days? Okay, that tend to happen after ten percent. And I'll have to show you the graphs of the ten percent or more moves, and you could see you could. When you look at that, you can see that there's some pretty substantial moves. And the in the spreadsheet, I have the percentage change that go that it goes down afterwards. Anyway, uh, just real quick, one thing that I quickly found out, the drawdowns with this or any long-term trend following system will be substantial. So you can see that was a $4,400 drawdown. 
And it actually, after being up quite a bit substantially, maybe six or seven grand here, this actually could have gone to zero. But fortunately, I did not get a sell signal. That little spill there was $3,600. This one here kind of hurt. That was an $8,000 drawdown. Now, when I got in this, I'm like, eh, this is SGs. Who cares? I figured I'd lose a couple hundred, 400 bucks or whatever, or make a couple thousand, whatever. And, and it would just be something to do for S and G's. I wasn't expecting it to turn into actually real money. I mean, that's uh, with the with the Q's at at fifty or five hundred something. That's fifty thousand dollars. So it's kind of crazy. Even ludicrous would say that's ludicrous. So the other thing I was looking at a few minutes ago is that wow, this thing stops out. That's going to be a six thousand dollar drawdown. But it's been a pretty damn good run. So. In the end, by the way, all trades end badly. Now, as from my perspective, from a trend follower's perspective, somebody who wants to stay with a trade as long as it moves in your favor, I guess if you're using some sort of option strategy with the butterfly and the iron condor wings and it's got to it's got to close right here and then everything works out, yeah, that could that could end optimally as one of my clients pointed out. He says he says, you shouldn't say it ends badly. He says, not optimally. Well, they all end badly, okay? Because in the end, you're going to give up some of the open profits. Look at those two last, which I consider decent trades. I'm happy I took both of them. Don't get me wrong. I always have clients complain. You know, they complain when they give up that second low. It's like, well, just send me whatever you made on the entire trade, that $1,000 or whatever the case may be, depending on your account size. And, uh, you know, keep a couple hundred bucks out as I preach, as I say to ad nauseum. Go get your massage so you could forget about that troublesome cast that you made on that trade and forget about the aggravation of that that drawdown of open profits. By the way, as I said a thousand times, uh, Dennis from the Turtles, he was one of the uh, Dennis and Eckert were the original Turtles that put together the team of Turtles. And Dennis was OK based on Curtis Facebook trading from the gut, which is a great little book. Oh, that, that was actually this turtle book, The Way of the Turtle. Um, if you're going to read a turtle book, read the turtle books that are written by turtles. I have a bit of a problem when somebody comes in and takes somebody else's stuff and, may, and, and, you know, sells it as their own or whatever, um, that weren't even part of the team or whatever. So that's, I, I don't know, but let me stay away from that, <laughs> but do read uh, his book and, and where I'm going with that is I swore I would never read the turtle books because they were written by non-turtles and then, um, Larry McMillan said, well, you need to read Curtis Facebook. And so if Larry McMillan tells me to do something, as long as it's legal, uh, I'll do it. Anyway, uh, as I've said quite a bit, we'll just go through this real quick. I, years ago, I did this. And then for whatever reason, I, I guess it became a lot of work and the market got choppy and I didn't feel like doing it anymore. But uh, I would just buy new highs, so to speak. This is the only thing that's not real trading. This is hypothetical here. But all I do is I, I buy new 52-week highs. The formula is about that big. And I run the scan every day. And it, it really doesn't take that long. And I just kick out the losers and put in good-looking stocks. So it's almost a constant window dressing where I'm kicking out the poor performers and keeping the strong ones. So this is mighty impressive. And there's really not that many losers in here now. But I do kick them out frequently, okay? But you can see this is at a pretty good move. And the thing that's amazing is all of these were bought at brand new highs. So this one here on 9-11, you can see it's breaking out the brand new highs and it really took off. Now, one thing that I've talked about before is, number one, you can't do this with just one or two stocks. You're going to need a, a, a sizable amount. And, and I know we got into statistics a couple of weeks ago. And um, I forgot to follow up on that. Uh, there's so much going on. But um, I'm not sure. You know, the 100 just seemed like a good round number. And that seems to work really well. And cash is also treated as an asset class. So if I can't find 100 stocks, then each slot, so to speak, uh, will in, that I can't find a stock for. Let's say if I got 80 stocks, and then it might be 20 slots of cash. And uh, right now, I'm doing this with a hypothetical million. 10K goes into every position. And it's been a lot of fun. And it's a great, it's a great learning experience. It's kind of fascinating. I know you're part of it with me, but 
it's kind of fascinating in that like a while back utilities were on fire and, and they might be coming back we'll take a look at them in a second and i would never never say never but it's like in the past i've never traded utilities but they're becoming the hot momentum because of the ai because of the uh, i guess crypto mining might have a little bit to do with that but the ai right now is going to be the big the big deal in fact uh was it amazon just bought a uh a, a nuclear facility i think anyway if you look at these numbers i think i have enlarged here so this is ran 200 and i put 238 it should be 228 it might have been 238 when i looked at it earlier but anyway uh all of these again bought at new highs you can see these numbers are just ridiculous going back to i think i started at the end of may it looks like the oldest one in here might have a june date right there and that's gev and that's up 100 percent. so this kind of shows me where the money is flowing I need to get around to doing it, but a while back, I had uh, I made these 3D pie graphs on, it, and you could see the sector action and all. I mean, some really geeky stuff. I'd love to get back into all that. And if anybody knows software that could help facilitate a lot of this stuff, just let me know. But I zoomed them in, and you could see these numbers are, are are pretty big. This is just the first, I guess, 40 or so of these. And you can see that a lot of triple digit gains in here, quite a few triple good digit gains, three, <laughs> but a lot of 94% and 90%. So and it's just, you're just buying brand new highs. That's all you're doing with that. And by the way, I did a, a couple times, I've been approached by people in stock picking contests. And if you were, if you have a child that's gonna enter a stock picking contest, just to keep things simple, just tell them to buy new highs, okay? and they'll probably do okay especially if they're in a rip-roaring bear market now i mentioned this one in the facebook group this is an ipo although i think if you check other charting services this one might not be as new as it seems so you you know the map is not the territory i say that often people are like what do you mean by that dave well here's here's like an ipo could set up this little ipo pattern but in reality is it's a stock that's been trading for a long time. So it's not really an IPO. So, you know, as I've said before, in one of the million little things presentations, trading is a million little things about a million little things. There's a lot of little stuff to keep up with. It's not hard, but there's a lot to it. And it's far from easy too. Anyway, this was an opening, this was kind of an opening gap reversal. And I also felt like, it could turn into a buy at B, which again, you could argue that, okay, wait a minute, this is not an IPO, but I thought it wasn't time. So my thinking was buying strength uh, intraday. And the buy was here and the sell was here. And I'll show you how I played that on an intraday basis. And again, I thought this was an IPO at the time. So buy at B would have been a buy right here. And then I saw this little opening gap reversal. I think it was worth a shot. But I just took it as a day trade. So you can see I got in just a couple of shares, kind of S and G stuff. 2804, round numbers 2857. And this is what it looks like on the intraday chart. So I let it open. And then when I saw it begin to rally, I bought it here. And then it just kind of waned later in the day. And then I got out here at 50 something. So Ideally, you want to kind of hang, you want to try to hang on, but it just couldn't hit the initial profit target. So I just felt like it was better than the poke in the eye, better than the poke in the eye type of trade. Okay, as I've said a thousand times, and eventually it'll be a million, right? <laughs> Everyone thinks that when they start trading, that they're going to have an epiphany and then bam, you know, they're a trader all of a sudden. Well, it doesn't really work like that. It's a many little things that'll make you a successful trader. And that's what, as these things pop into my head, I make a note and we talk about them. So number 827,913, last two weeks ago at Bandcamp, I mentioned viewpoints of a commodity trade. And this, that got me thinking about these little books, these little old books. I've got a couple laying around my desk. This one is Psychology of the Stock Market. I'd recommend you read that and uh this one just randomly on my desk and it's been a long time since i've read it but i noticed it's got a lot of notes in it 
studies in tape reading by Rollo Tape. And I think that's a, what do you call it, a pen name? But anyway, the, this is this is a great little book. And this is one that once I start quoting it, I can't stop. And so I just put a couple in here tonight. But this is something that if you go through this copy of mine, it's got like lots of dog ears and lots of notes. It's a great little book. And I think, as I said before, it's like it's such a little book, it gets lost in all this mess I have it here. And then I just keep buying a new copy. And then finally, I bought a um, Kindle version. <laughs> so that one doesn't get lost. Anyway, read The Psychology of the Stock Market by G.C. Selden. And what's amazing is, and I'm kind of getting a little ahead of myself, but what's amazing is these books that were written well over 100 years ago, in some cases, it, it, there's nothing new under the sun. And even in Livermore's book, Reminiscences of a Stock Operator, he actually said there's nothing new under the sun when it comes to the markets. Well, there's nothing new under the sun it goes all the way back to the Bible, and I think it was Ecclesiastes, okay? So what's amazing is you'll get a lot of good stuff out of these old, old books. Like I said before, I used to, like if my wife would go to bed early on a Friday or Saturday night and I'd have a couple of beers, I'd come in here <laughs> and search for, uh, speculation is a good thing to search for on eBay. You look for those old books. What do they call them? An old book, Antiquated, or I forget what they call them. But look in that category, and you'll find a lot of good stuff. Um, I got my office is littered with them. I gave away all my new books. <laughs> and I, I kept all the old ones. Anyway, uh, just kind of some random quote, quotes from this book. Few persons are so introspective as to be able to tell where this bias in favor of their own interest begins and where it leaves off. Still fewer bother to make the effort to tell so what's kind of fascinating is and this is what i was getting to a second ago is that gc selden kind of talks about all this behavioral science and all this behavioral finance and all the fancy words they call it today and this was again at least 100 years ago 19 early 1900s so it's actually a public domain by the way you can go to davelandry.com slash books dash two dash read and you could pick this one. It's only like five bucks. I think you can get it free on the internet, but I like having a hard copy. Humphrey Neal, tape reading, 1930 maybe, had a ticker tape ribbon. Uh, yeah, that sounds that sounds interesting. I wonder if that's uh, I wonder if that's the same guy as Rolo tape. This is actually might be uh, Wyckoff. So this might be, if I'm reading this right, this might be by Wyckoff. Wyckoff. Gotta watch how I say that. <laughs> Gonna lose my uh, monetization of my video. If you're long or short of the market, you are not an unprejudiced judge, and you will be greatly tempted to put such an interpretation upon the current events as will coincide with your preconceived opinion. Lately, I've been doing some writing where it's kind of interesting. I'll write about something, then I'll read the same thing or something very similar to it a few days later. And lately, I've been writing, okay, what is the market doing and what do you want it to do? Okay, and it's easy to answer what is the market doing as long as it's doing what you want it to do, okay? It's when it's not, you find yourself thinking, oh, well, well, maybe it's just oversold or maybe it'll come back. And you might start confusing the issue with facts. But again, once you start quoting it, it's, it, it I literally was just looking, kind of flipping through it. And I found this, the average man is an optimist regarding his own enterprises and a pessimist regarding those of others. Well, the first half of that is is kind of the beginning of the Dunning-Kruger effect, which I've talked about before. I hope I'm saying that right. And the second half is some other behavioral finance or behavioral science that's out there. And I'm kind of reminded of Annie Duke in one of her books, and it, it might be on how to decide. I, I really couldn't get into how to decide, but um, what's the other one? Thinking in bets is worth reading. Again, davelandry.com slash books dash two dash read. And in that How to Decide book, she did mention something that's kind of interesting. I think that was where she mentioned it. But anyway, it was Annie, I know it was Annie Duke. And it kind of makes a good example for this, what uh, Mr. Sheldon is saying. If you were to stand outside a church 
And as the bride and groom come out, a friend of mine was an alcoholic, and uh, he's like, we're not going to this wedding. What we would do, he, he says, I'll show you what to do. So I was like, all right, fine. So we'd go to, we'd go to a bar that was nearby, and then right when the wedding was getting ready to let out, we'd, we'd go stand and let the doors open. <laughs> and we'd be there to greet him in you know a way like hey <laughs> so anyway i digress but the um if you were to stand there after going to the bar you know and, and you wait for them to come out the bride and groom and you say real quick what are your chances of this marriage not ending in a divorce and they would they would if provided and punch you in the face they'd be like oh well, this marriage is gr- going to be great but if you ask that same couple what are the chances of a marriage down the street that's happening at the same time? What's the chances of those people making it? And what would they tell you? Well, 50%. That's the that's the average. Okay. So that's kind of a kind of the way we kind of looked at things in kind of a twisted kind of way. And that's why I get so heavily into psychology. And I think one reason is because I'm plagued so heavily by trading psychology. And that's why I spent so much time working on it. If if you could just be completely flippant and do what has to be done, then there's really no need for the psychology. And a lot of times I am pretty flippant. I'm getting better, okay? And that's one of the things that I probably should say as one of my many little things is be flippant, okay? Be flippant in your execution, but make sure you're picking the best and leaving the, and leaving the rest. But yeah, the psychology could be tough. And, and, you know, like one of my big epiphanies there was when I took uh, Jason Williams, I think that's his name, is Larry Williams' son, and uh, he wrote a, a pretty good book. And most of the book talks a lot about psychology tests. And I took a psychology test, and it, it turns out that I'm not very agreeable. <laughs> I scored like a zero in agreeableness, and my whole family was home one night when I came home from work. And I'm like, hey, can you guys believe this? And they looked at me like I pooed my pants. <laughs> yeah. So I'm the probably the least agreeable person on earth. And that could be detrimental to your trading. So it's it's a it's definitely a discovery within when it comes to trading. Now, along the lines of what Mr. Sheldon was saying, and somewhere in here he goes, No, I think I might have it in a in an upcoming slide, but Number 147773, you need to ask yourself these two questions. What's the psychology of the market? Okay. When I saw Bitcoin making 90 something thousand this morning, I'm like, okay, what's the psychology there? Well, there's some buyers. Okay. And there's a lot of probably FOMO coming into the market. So you kind of have to wrap your head about what's going on with these players. And and if it, there's a stock that looks like electrocardiogram, well, there's a lot of people want to buy, a lot of people want to sell it, probably institutions feeding it to. I mean, who knows? But you could, kind of get a feel for what the psychology of the market is. And the more important question is, what is your own psychology? Like in the, the, I guess Spock had died and then they brought him back or whatever. And he's taking these little, um, this little test to like re-educate his brain to see how smart he is. And they're asking him all, it's asking him all these questions. It looks like an old, um, like what's those old video game machines? Like an old Space Invaders machine, you know, bad tech. <laughs> low res graphics and and asking them all these uh they could travel the speed of light but graphics suck <laughs> and they're asking him it's asking him all these questions these he's rapid fire rapid fire rapid fire and one of them is how do you feel and then he could he couldn't answer that one because of his logic brain and everything and he kept working through the others but that's that's an important thing you know what's your own psychology as i preach there's so many extraneous influences when it comes to trading, we just got a new puppy. We, we lost a dog a few weeks back, a few months back, and that was really hard on us. And, and so that that affects you, okay? We got a new puppy, so that affects our sleep. Um, you know, market's closing, puppy's got to go out today. It's like, ah, so it's like, that's that's messing with things. And that's kind of an obvious thing. And in some cases, it's, it's maybe not so obvious, okay? But all this little stuff adds up that's going on in your life. So what's going on with your own psychology? Did you just make a lot of money trading and you feel like just frittering frittering away because you're lottery rich? Or did you just lose a lot of money trading and you're afraid to take this next opportunity? And the list goes on and on and on. But um, as I preach a fight with a spouse, significant other, or both, that could really mess with your trading. 
anyway, uh, this is early in the book, first page or two. Like I said, you, you start reading this and you're gonna, you'll be quoting it too. The psychological aspects of speculation may be considered from two points of view, equally important. One question is, what effect do varying mental attitudes of the public have upon the course of prices? How is the character of the market influenced by psychological conditions, okay? So think about that. What are people thinking, okay? Well, I woke up and I'm looking at Bitcoin. It's at all-time highs. Anyone who has ever bought a piece of Bitcoin or any Bitcoin, whatever, is at a profit with the exception of the person who just bought it five minutes ago, okay? So that's obviously a strong market. And, you know, who are the players, okay? You got something like GME when it goes crazy. You've got hedge funds getting squeezed out, getting punished. You got all these little kids uh, just throwing this money at it. All these crazy things happening, okay? A second consideration is how does the mental attitude of the individual trader affect his chances of success? To what extent and how can he overcome the obstacles placed in his pathway by his own hopes and fears, his timidities, timidities, I, I guess I gotta be careful while I say that word, and obstinacies. So I think it means that if you're timid and obstinate, these uh, these old books, they do have a lot of flowery, uh, like sophistries is somewhere in here. I've never, um, I've never heard of that word until reading one of these old books. But anyway, right there, it's kind of like where I, I came up with this with this question um, a few weeks ago or a few days ago, whatever, and then I read Selden and it's right there in Selden. So good stuff. And I strongly urge you to read it. Uh, and it's so, you know, it's a one sitter, nice little book. All right, let's shift gears and jump into crypto. If you guys want me to look at any crypto pairs, let me know. We could do that now. Ah. This is so. This is frustrating. See, you just heard, you heard me um, complain. So that's not everything goes well, right? Here's that DGen, and look how close I came to the IPT, right? That's kind of a bummer. I might just bail on that. All right, so let's take a look at Bitcoin. Oh, ninety-eight thousand. Now I'm going to make a prediction that's outside of what I normally do. And this kind of goes back to like the Livermore thinking uh, with stocks. When stocks hit a round number like 100, they tend to go much higher, okay? Now, I wouldn't just buy a stock because it hits 100, but it is kind of interesting. And my thinking with, with Bitcoin is if it hits 100K, it's going to go to 200K fairly quickly. Now, that's that's... I'm not a trend predictor because people always ask me, how long is the market take to get here? And would I work for an options hedge fund and nearly kill me? You know, it's like, uh, well, how far will it go? How long will it take? It's like, I don't know. I just, it's, you know, it's going up. You know, where's my big blue arrow? I got to have a big blue arrow, a physical big blue arrow. So it's going up. So that looks pretty darn good. Now, Ethereum has been uh, lagging. Take a look at Ethereum, the Bitcoin, you could see. And uh, there's your 30 EMA, okay? Look at most of this trend, okay? This is how weak Ethereum has been compared, compared to Bitcoin. 90% of this trend has been below that, or 95% below that 30 EMA. So as a general statement, crypto included, Never buy a market that's below the 30 EMA. Now, somebody in the group uh, just mentioned a little while ago that they like to look at Ethereum being stretched away from from Bitcoin, and then they they look to to beat to take like a, a kind of an arbitrage type of play, maybe a day trade. So it's a little outside of what I normally do, but I find it interesting. So I'm I'm anxious to. I saw the post literally right before it went live. And I typed a few notes in, but I, I want to look at what he's doing and pick that apart a little bit. I think he might be on to something. So thank you for that in the in the Facebook group. Anyway, so Ethereum obviously outperforming Bitcoin by quite a bit. 
Now, as I said earlier, sometimes you can just uh, sort these by strength. And if they're banging out new highs and a little bit of vigor and a few more caveats, sometimes you just go in and buy the ones that are banging out new highs when everything's blowing and going. There's that XM, XLM again. So that's looking pretty good. Again, sometimes you could just buy them when they make a new highs. This uh, kid was over here and he wanted to learn how to trade. I'm like, well, this is making new highs. Oh, I might have bought on this day here. And it's, it's, that's why I'm buying it. And he couldn't, he couldn't wrap his head around just buying something because it goes up. And he's like, you know, then he was like, well, Ripple's going to do this. And I hear that there's going to do this. And, and, and the government's going to do this. And it's like, well, you know, that might all happen. But don't confuse the issue with facts. That needs to be one of those million little things. Let's see what we have going on here. So nothing's really jumping out at me. Oh, there's Ripple. Okay, ironically, there you go. There's one that's going up. I guess the time to buy it would have been on the breakout back here, but you can see it's still going up, okay? So again, sometimes you can just buy the strongest ones. I'd hold off for now. But if they pull back, like that D-Gen looked pretty good, although I'm a little disappointed in it, obviously. Okay, any pairs you want me to take a look at for you? All right, we'll hop over to stocks real quick. All right, give me a few minutes to go over the overall market. It won't take long. And then we could get to your stock picks if you have any. In fact, let me know if you have any stock picks now. Let me change my application to over here. All right, take a look at the P's. Uh, gap open today, uh, kind of a strong sell-off, but then recovered to close fairly well. So that's a that's kind of a fake-out shakeout, okay? It kind of sucked people in, spit them out, and then began to take off again. And it actually closed, I'm just realizing this right now, I've forgotten about this, or I didn't notice. It actually closed that gap that we had down. So that's a good thing when a gap gets closed like that. A lot of times gaps can be support or resistance. You can see this last gap became a bit of support, okay? It's a fallacy, by the way, that all gaps are closed. You might go years without closing a gap. So, well, okay, it's closed. But, you know, we might have a gap. We probably have a gap from um well maybe not the 30s but there's some gaps in the market here and there especially individual stocks that never get filled but the p's look pretty good uh, you can see this is today moving average okay lots of land you're like there about a year's worth and then your 50s right here so it's hugged to 50 fairly well lately and we're not too too far away from all-time highs about a percent just eyeballing it let's just do all time let's do a closing high so we are yeah right at almost exactly one percent away from all-time closing highs the trend guy i'm not gonna argue with that nasdaq Composite, it had a bit of an opening gap reversal it did recover but it didn't recover as much as the peas it actually went into flatsville so that's a bit of a bummer, but it did close the gap. So that's certainly a good thing. And we're holding above the last little breakout for the most part. So that's a good thing there too. The Rusty finally got its ad together. Now, remember a few weeks back, I talked about guy from the gym who got out of break even and was happy to get out of break even. And I tried to explain to him that trading for break even is, is, is a loser strategy. But anyway, he looked... Um, he looked kind of smart when it started coming back in, but now it's beginning to rally. It, it, it held the gap, okay? And then it, come, it didn't come all the way back in. It didn't come below where it broke out, I should say. It did do an ogre into where it broke out, but so far so good in the rusty. Now, this thing has been all over the place, but we're pushing into these new highs, all-time highs. So if we can get the new highs and stay there, that would certainly be a positive. Gold's headed higher as of late. That's impressive last few days because the dollar has been pretty strong a, a weak dollar is going to make higher prices as a general statement in commodities because they're dollar denominated okay there's some talk if we ever denominated um like the petrodollar if we went away from the petrodollar the market could get in a lot of trouble petrol market but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it gold stocks not looking so high. Pretty serious spill here. We had a bow tie back here. They imploded from that. Now it's backing up a little bit, pulling back a little bit. So that one's looking like it could be in trouble. No stocks, at least. 
Broker dealer doing pretty good, right at all time highs. I'm not going to argue with that. Back to the downside, biotechnology, a little bit of a bounce lately. It's been mostly a dead cat bounce from where I sit. And we have lots and lots of overhead supply to deal with there. Infrastructure, something I don't pay a lot of attention to, but it is an ETF that's begging out new highs with a little bit of vigor. I let the database find the stocks for me mostly. Occasionally, I'll dig within a, an individual sector, especially if I find some setups within it. But anyway, uh, software right at all-time highs today, rallying nicely out of that pullback. Defense stocks, a bit of a bummer. They broke out and came right back in, so I would avoid defense for now. Let's take a look at the transports. Transports, not the prettiest chart in the world, but definitely an uptrend followed by a bit of a pullback. So that looks okay. I hate to admit it, but jets look pretty good. My system for the airlines is wait until they go up and then short them. But I can't argue with this. This is a pretty persistent trend. So we'll see if it can sustain it. I just don't like the airlines that much. I know it should confuse the issue with facts, but I can tell you right now that as a general statement, they're they're usually tough to to trade look they're all over the place and i've done a lot of mechanical testing a lot of these things educational stocks don't tend to trend very well shipping stocks don't tend to trend very well but what's crazy is something like shipping can just go straight up for for three or four days 100 percent or whatever something nuts but as a general statement those areas don't trend that well banks rally on a pullback almost to all-time highs that looks pretty good take a look at insurance bam winning all-time highs Financials in general doing pretty good. They got on all time highs today. So that's obviously a good thing. Energies have come back with a vengeance. They're all over the place, but they're almost to brand new highs, all time highs. So that's pretty impressive there. Again, it's kind of a tale of two markets, as I've been saying quite a bit. Now, Mags is a little bit of a bummer. It's stalling out a bit in here, open a gap reversal. But it was just at all-time highs, and it, for the most part, it is holding above the prior breakout level, so that's a good thing. So, so far, so good in mags. Go back to the downside, major drugs, so far, just pulling back, serious downtrend. You can see you had a bow tie back here, pretty serious slide out of that. Now you're just having a generic pullback in this downtrend, so that's not pretty. Back to the upside, sky cloud computing, making all-time highs, so that's certainly a good thing. Semiconductors pushing into this overhead supply. But they've got their work cut out for them. I wouldn't get too excited about the semis until unless they can go on to make some brand new highs. Uh, a couple more areas. Bonds, you can see, remain in pretty serious downtrend. Uranium has been improving, improving as of late. It's kind of all over the place, but it has been improving. And lithium, I've been keeping an eye on lithium and some lithium stocks. Let me just punch it in. It's kind of a wild and crazy one, too. But you can see it's trying to rally a little bit. It just went straight up, had a serious correction, and now it's trying to rally out of it. But it's, believe me, it's all over the place. A couple more sectors, and I think we're done for the market. Uh, utilities were just rolling over not that long ago, but now they're coming back with a vengeance. So maybe some of these micro nuclear or whatever stocks like NNE or something. This was our big winner a while back. Unfortunately, like I said, when you get these melt-ups like this, it's hard to sustain. I wish I wish there were options on it so I could have done some option plays and all once I, I nabbed that, whatever that stupid move was overnight, 300% or whatever. Um, but it's going back to, it looks like it's going back to new highs. Maybe it'll set up again. But this is kind of exciting because these, Utilities are actually beginning to trade like momentum stocks. Okay, any individual stocks you guys want me to look at? I've got a quiet bunch tonight. Be happy to take a look at them. We've got a good crowd tonight. Good to see everybody making it. Usually when I skip a show and nobody shows up in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> okay, going once. Going twice. Well, while we're in the impasse, I want to thank everybody for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules. Anything can answer, Dave at DaveLandry.com. I'll see all you guys and girls, uh, most of you guys and girls, I should say, that are here. I'll see you in the Facebook group tomorrow. Everybody else, have a great weekend. Hope to see you again next week, of course. No, no, no. Next week's Thanksgiving, so no show next week. So, everybody, uh, have a happy weekend. Have a good weekend. Happy Thanksgiving. And may the trend be with you. Thank you so much. You're welcome.
Okay, N and E has options now. That's good to know. I bet they're ridiculous, huh? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not in uh, like covered calls, but I wonder. Larry um, McMillan was doing this a while back with those. Um, what do you call those things? Um, a stock that comes public, but it's not really a public. Um, oh, there was a there was a, a name for them too. There was like a, a an acronym for them. It's a stock that comes public, and they become like a. Um, they later become a company, whatever. Uh, oh, it's gonna kill me. I'm gonna have to find out. Let me see. Acquisition companies, okay? These stupid little acquisition companies. Um, you know, yeah. wait till they begin to take off. Don't just buy one because you'll probably end up losing your money. But anyway, what McMillan I think was doing was he would he would buy those stocks and then he would sell options on them but he'd keep like a small amount of shares almost like a ridiculously small amount of shares like maybe like he'd buy a thousand shares and he'd sell nine call options because as an option trader he just those options were so ridiculous that he felt and, and i'm saying you don't go out don't go out and do it yourself spocks that's the word i'm looking for okay spocks yeah, or SPACs, as uh, they say on, they call them SPACs on TV, but SPACs is what I call them in most traders I know. Uh, but anyway, so he would he would end up keeping just a few hundred shares or didn't sell options on the whole loaf because sometimes these things just go up and just keep on going up. So that was kind of cool. Okay, sneaking in one here real quick. All right, we'll do that, Keith, and then we'll shut down. KMI, Kinder Morgan. Yeah, that looks good. It's um, it's just going up though. Okay, it's just this would be like an Landry 100. The HV is a little low at 22. Lately, anything below 25, I've been really not even paying attention to. But yeah, on a pullback, that's a good-looking stock. But I prefer a little higher uh, volatility in my stocks. But yeah, put that on your momentum list for sure. That might the the reason this one isn't probably on the Landry 100 is because when I put stocks in them, well, I'm going to give away my secret here. There's no secrets, believe me. But what I do with the Landry 100 is I pick the the higher volatility stocks before the ones that are lower in volatility. So let me just show you real quick, and then I need to shut down. But here's that list sorted by, see, look, 97. So you can see these things, 97, that's a 226% gain. 92 so the hv is is super high for the most part in these so i picked the highest hv ones first as i'm going through the list on the ones that are making new highs and you can see let me just show you the tracking percentage let's flip this around so look there is some negative in here i don't want to make it look like they go straight up so there's a few in here that might get weeded out soon if they don't go straight back up but there's some really good looking stocks in the list okay i think we're done now <laughs> so again happy thanksgiving have a good weekend happy thanksgiving see you guys week after next see everybody else in uh facebook tomorrow again once again may the trend be with you thank you